All right. Okay. Um, so, so uh, thank you very much, Max. So here's my, yeah, thank you all for coming and also to all the listeners online. Um, today, I want to give you an introduction to quantum theory for non-physicists. What I'm going to talk about are five main chapters. First of all, I want to present to you what the state of physics was at the beginning of the 20th century and where suddenly experiments appeared, uh, which weren't explainable by theories of electromagnetism or Newton's classical mechanical theory. Then um, in the second chapter, it's going to be a bit math heavy. We're going to do a quick recap on linear algebra. And I want to show you the concept that vectors and functions are not that different. We can have, they have very similar concepts. So we're going to generalize linear algebra to function spaces. Um, then maybe, up, because it was a bit heavy, maybe a quick five minute break, and then we're going to talk about the Schrodinger equation. The basic concept of quantum mechanics. <laughs> <laughs> there will be a test. <laughs> I'm going to show you the main concepts and show you one simple problem, how to solve it, so that you get the basic concept. And in the fourth chapter, we're going to take a very, very light uh, introduction to angular momenta in quantum mechanics and spin. And as the Fifth chapter, I'm going to show you, I want to show you like what we're doing at MEC, where we are starting. I want to show you the basic system, what we are solving. What is MEC? Meta under extreme conditions. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, 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 I asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's an okay question. <laughs> that's an okay, question. <laughs> uh, okay, let's start. Oh. Okay. Let's start. Okay. Um, first of all, I would like to talk to you about physics at the turn of the 20th century. So we had two basic theories about how matter behaves and how radiation and uh, fields behave. So we had uh, Newton with his basic equation that the forces generate a dynamic for any matter point. Um, furthermore, we had uh, we have the uh, Maxwell's equation, which you see here on the right hand side, which show you the how fields behave. So in this, like electric fields behave, the E for this in this case stands for electric field and B for the magnetic field. Those are the two theories which can explain you everything from liquids to planetary dynamics to um, light and even. Elect electronics and elect uh, like telegraphs or cables and stuff like that. Um, so everyone thought this was fine. This was a complete theory. You can explain everything we see. And um, a lot of people said, okay, we don't need to study physics anymore. But then? Just, just one very small question maybe for some, I, I think the double dot oh, yeah. <laughs> is a... The double dot means the second derivative um, with respect to time. Good that you said that. <laughs> that uh, yeah, two dots mean always a, a dot means always a derivative with respect to time. That's physics notation. So yeah. I have a question on on, uh, on what the R is here in this equation. That's I it's the force. I guess m is mass. T is yeah. time. What is R? Uh, R is the uh, uh, vector of a point mass in space where it is currently. So position. so the position of a of a some object. Okay. So if if you have it. If you have like uh, a mass here at a position in space R, and it moves somehow, R out of T describes the trajectory of the mass in space. Okay. So it's just a function, and Newton's equation gives <laughs> you where it is. What, where it is. Well, but since this is like position, you take the second derivative, that's like, what, like acceleration? Acceleration. Acceleration, yes. Okay. That makes sense, as far as it's mass times as acceleration. Okay, I think I got that. Okay, so um, that's just a basic concept which they had there. And um, what popped up suddenly was that uh, we that there were a few experiments which made people wonder. And first of all, I want to talk to you about double slit experiments. And uh, first of all, um, Let's take a double slit experiment with bullets. 
it's called. So we have a gun here which fires bullets in a statistical way. It's not a really good gun. It fires in random directions all the time, and we have two slits there. And let's assume, like physics, physicists love to do that, that the bullets are indestructible and the walls are also indestructible, and they just uh, go through uh, one of the slits here and um, um, hit a wall called the backstop. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, at the backstop, we have a movable detector, which um, detects where the bullets are. So if there is a bullet hitting at, some, at a certain position, it detects just the bullet and how many bullets there are. And uh, let's first do this with only one of the slits open. So case B, what will we see as a, um, as a uh, uh, distribution of the bullets with, as a function of, of X here, like a, a space. So if you only, so P1 is the case where only one bullet hits us, uh, uh, where only one slit is open and we fire multiple bullets through the slit. So what we see is a uh, Gaussian centered at the slit. <clears throat> and the same goes for this if we only have to leave the second slit open. If we now have both slits open, we will see the overlap of, two, of those two effects. So simply the addition of both slit slits. Great, that's intuitive somehow. Like it's a, not, there's not, nothing really special going on there. If we do the same thing for waves now, like water waves, in assuming we have a wave source somewhere and also have two slits here and an absorber here, which detects how many, uh, what's the intensity of the waves that arrives at the back. What will we see if we only leave one of the slits open? We will see the same thing as with the bullets. We will see a Gaussian distribution centered at the slit. For both cases, it's only one of the slits is open. But what happens if we leave both slits open? Then we will see suddenly this weird pattern here. It's a fundamental, uh, it's a fundamental thing called interference of both waves. So why do we see this pattern here? So assume we have a wave going out at one in a straight way and another wave leaving two also in a straight way so that they hit at the same point. And uh, let's assume like very, very, very simple um, forms of both waves. Like just assume that both waves starting here at, uh, at slit one and two have a simple cosine form. So we <clears throat> This is how a wave uh, looks, uh, or a general wave is written when it propagates through space. So uh, first of all, X is the position in space. T is the time. So what is K? K is the so-called wave number. It's, um, the, uh, um, it's a characteristic length for, the, for a wave. It's uh, two pi over lambda, where lambda is the wavelength. And the wavelength is the length where between two maxima on a wave, for instance. So if you have a wave here, you see where the wave starts again to be, uh, to do its wave-like behavior. So where it does, so the wavelength is here in between two maxima. And, um, so um, that's the general form of it. So it's uh, because we cannot plug anything with a unit and uh, into the cosine, we also have to get rid of the unit for time, which is, which is in this case omega, which takes care of this is the frequency. And omega is um, <clears throat> simply the frequency of this. So what's the second wave? The second wave arrives at the detector assuming with the, we assume it started out with the same function form, but with a different phase. We have with an additional phase here called, we just call it phi in this case. 
And um, what we will detect in the end is the uh, total square of um, both waves at this point. Which means we have here a cosine kx minus omega t plus cosine kx minus omega t plus phi. <coughs> so if we look at the co at the cosine a bit, um, we will soon realize that the cosine turns into its negative when this phase here um, is something like some whole number times pi where n equals um, <coughs> uh, plus minus one, plus minus two, and so on. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, if, 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 yeah. <laughs> if, if you look at the cosine of, 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 of x, it's the negative of the cosine of x uh, uh, plus pi. So this means if our our face is something like, uh, if our wave picked up a face of pi because it has a, had a longer way arriving at the absorber, both things will cancel out. Like su suddenly we'll have a cancellation of both, uh, of, of, of the waves arriving there because we detect the sum of both waves. And the same goes if, uh, if it's a uh, whole of two pi, we will see that both waves suddenly add up together and form a maximum. Here I showed a quick plot of something of a sine curve if it's shifted by pi. So this is, so we will have exactly the wave maxima cancel each other out there. If we have a, if we see a minimum in the interference pattern. Okay, great. That's a something fundamental behavior of waves. This is how waves behave if you would like to detect them. And very important. So let's for the shits and giggles do this double slit experiment with electrons. Same thing as with the bullets, but this time we'll do electrons, shooting at some electron gun through two, two slits. And um, if we only leave one slit open, we get our bullet result again. And now the weird thing is, um, when we have both slits open, we suddenly get an interference pattern. And this is strange, strange. <laughs> um, because we saw um, electrons, you would say they are a localized particle like a bullet. There's no real difference. So you would say it's a mass moving through it. But suddenly we have an electron doing interference with it. So we could now argue, okay, we have maybe a lot of electrons there and we don't know through which slip they go. Maybe it's just some weird field thing and so on. So what can we do? Maybe let's do an experimental setup where we detect first through which slip the electron goes by placing a light source at the location of both slits. What then happens is even weirder, then suddenly we will get the bullet result again. If the electron, if the, it's like we place a light source here and the electron will interact with the light source and we will know through which slit the electron will go. And suddenly we get a result back that looks like the bullet result, like a particle result. And if you think that's not really strange, it's also strange for me. So if you're confused, nothing to worry about. <laughs> Nobody can really explain why that is. <clears throat> yes, we can. I mean, fundamental <laughs> 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 oh, perspective. Okay, so this is um, this is the this is the weird result we suddenly got there. We could not. We first thought electrons were massive particles moving through space like this, but suddenly we got interference effects. 
And yeah, this was really weird for people discovering that suddenly. A funny thing for that. So the guy who found out that electrons were particles was J.J. Thompson, who received the Nobel Prize in 1906 for this. And his son, George Paget Thompson, uh, did this experiment with the double slit on electrons and found out that they are waves. And they both got their Nobel Prizes for this. And this made some very curious conversations at the at dinner, probably. <laughs> so he showed that electrons are particles, he showed that electrons behave like waves. So great. <laughs> Kiss these days. Kiss these days, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, so moving on. The next thing, uh, classical physics, Newton, and, if I talk about classical physics, I talk about Newton and Maxwell. They could, it's kind of also kind of expand really atomic spectra. Because if you say like atomics, uh, like an atom is nothing more than an electron in a, uh, circling around the nucleus, uh, you will run into trouble because uh, electrons on circular orbits will radiate. And radiation means that they lose energy. So at some point, the electrons will simply crash into the core after a few nanoseconds, so it wouldn't have stable matter. So that's something inexplainable by classical theories. Yeah. Why, why would they radiate? Um, that's something fundamental. If a charge is accelerated, if like a charge particle is accelerated, it will radiate, it will, uh, radi uh, radiate, uh, it will cause radiation. That's something you get from Maxwell's equations. Okay, but does it accelerate? Yes, uh, uh, circular orbit is uh, always an uh, accelerated um, trajectory. The speed stays the same, but the direction of this, of this changes. Speed changes because, and that's an acceleration. Ah, okay. And now you're coming back to R dot dot. Exactly, yes. Because R dot dot is not zero for a circular, uh, for a circular. Even if, the, mm -hmm. even if the velocity stays the same, the direction changes. And the direction change is it's it acceleration, acceleration, yeah. Acceleration. Yeah, because it's, okay. it's, it's a change in velocity already. Uh, yeah. The velocity is the vector, the speed is. Speed, yeah, sorry. <laughs> it's my English. <laughs> okay, yeah. So, does okay. that answer the question? It does, it does answer it, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. I, I, in, the, in the picture, you're somewhat mixing up the change in orbit and just the motion on the circle. Yeah, that's just a picture I wanted to give of Bohr's model, but uh, we don't have time to explain Bohr's model at the moment. So. <laughs> uh, next thing is the photoelectric effect. Um, that's um, the effect you get if you shine UV light on a metal or a semiconductor you will immediately see that electrons suddenly come out of the metal or material. Um, and the weird thing is that this effect happens instantaneously and also um, it's, in, it's independent of the intensity of the light you shine on this. Um, you would expect that the more light you shine on it, the more uh, at some intensity you will see uh, uh, electrons going out there. And only, you only see this effect uh, at a critical wavelength of the light you shine on there. So if you have like low wavelength light shining on the metal, you won't see uh, you won't see this effect. But you would expect it because it, you, Maxwell would say, okay, we shine light on this metal, and the electrons pick up energy over time through the light. At some point, they will have enough energy to leave the metal, but they don't. And um, this effect uh, was explained by Einstein. And he proposed that he made a radical step and said that light must consist or maybe consists of small energy packages, which have an energy proportional um, to its frequency of the light. So mu is the light frequency in this case. And H is the proportionality constant for this called Planck's constant. So it gives you the, uh, the energy of, uh, of these light wave packages. And uh, light wave packages package can be absorbed by an electron and it gains energy to leave the metal suddenly. So this was a really radical step, of course, to say that, okay, there's some 
particle, there's also some particle property to, um, to light in there. And this perfectly explained the whole effect <coughs> for it. Um, great, so now we have a few experiments which showed us that obviously the theories of Maxwell and Newton are not complete and we need to expand them somehow. And, and this is for why he got the Nobel Prize. Yes. Not for uh, relativity or anything. Yeah. That's why he got the Nobel Prize. Yeah. That's, that's it. <laughs> um, okay, so before we can expand it, we have to recap a bit on linear algebra. So, um, in the next sections, um, so I want to give you a quick recap on this. Um, first question, does every one of you know what a matrix is? Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> And um, also the online audience, do I need to explain that? They're gone already. They're, they're gone, okay. <laughs> 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 so we know that um, a matrix A is nothing more than a linear mapping between two, two vector spaces, U and V. And linearity simply means that if you have Thank you, thank you, Ulrich, for <laughs> <laughs> We're not talking about the third movement here. No. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to write it down the definition of linearity for you. you. I agree. Um, <laughs> um, if you, if you apply a, a function. <laughs> or like a linear mapping between two vector spaces, you, and you have a scalar before each argument, you can take the scalar out and so simply apply the function to the vector you have there. That's the definition of linearity, basically. And this is what makes <coughs> all of the sense. Okay, great. Then I can skip <laughs> a few things. And um, another question, um, do you know, uh, about eigenvalues, should I quickly recap on those? Okay, so if we have a, a scalar and we take this one as complex numbers, we call it an eigenvalue. To a matrix A. If so, there's a there's a um, there's a vector from. Let's take this matrix out of the complex n cross n matrices. That A times V equals lambda times v. What does, so our vector is just simply mapped, uh, is uh, simply uh, scaled through A. So if we say that this is v and we apply A to it, afterwards we will have the same direction but a different, but a different uh, length scaled by lambda. So we somehow preserve the direction of the vector in the matrix, through the matrix. This is what the eigenvalue is defined as. All right? Not the rigorous definition for all the mathematicians out there, but uh, basically that's, that's what it does. And um, this will later become important because we'll see what that eigenvalues are really, really important for quantum mechanics. <laughs> okay, um, the next thing I would talk about, which is very important to understand the following chapter is inner products. And uh, it's a mapping which um, is denoted by something like by this 
symbol often which takes in two vectors from a vector space V. Um, sorry. And maps it to the complex numbers. And has to fulfill certain conditions. Um, first of all, it has to be linear in the um, first argument. Does everybody get that notation? No. Okay, okay. So, great, that's a great point. So, um, this notation, this dot stands for some argument in there. So, what I would like to say with this, this is the just. You define a binary operator. Yeah. Binary okay. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you put two arguments in there and you get a complex number out. And, simply. and what is the second part of that definition there? What does this tell me on the arguments and the output of the function? You mean this part here? Yeah. Um, this, this tells you that you take two vectors in. So a vector and a vector, and you get a complex number out. A V is a vector space. Like okay. uh, V is, great. Uh, v is something like the R to the power N, or in our case, you would like to do like, like vectors of complex. V is a vector. Yes, V is a vector. A scalar is a complex of reals or? A uh, pump. Like V is a vector of real V is numbers. a vector of, of, of real numbers or complex numbers. Doesn't, it's okay. Not, okay. It doesn't really matter for the definition. In this case, I would like to refer, uh, would like to confine ourselves to complex, to complex like vectors which have complex numbers as the entries. Okay. So you take two vectors, it produces a complex number. That's what the operator yes, does. Yes, exactly. Okay, yes, and you want the uh, operation to have the following um, properties. So it should be linear in the first argument. So if I add something in the first argument, it's the same as I would um, do the same operate do the scalar product operation for both of the first arguments with this second vector z. So x, z, and y are just vectors out of this vector space v in this case, which is the complex like number. Kind of distributivity. Okay. Yes. Okay. Fair enough. Yes. So and second of all. If you take a scalar in front of a vector in the first argument, since we have in this lambda can be a complex number in this case, we, will, we would like to, uh, we want uh, the, um, oper the operation to have um, be equal to the complex conjugate times the operation. So you can take out a scalar in the first argument and write it in front of it, but you have to take the complex conjugate of it. So do you know what the complex conjugate is? Okay. So uh, co about complex numbers, did you, yeah, okay. I have a guess what it is. Yeah, yeah so, so a complex number is a number that, that's written in a form of x plus i times y. So it's a number, it's like a two-dimensional number. Yeah, it's a number with like yeah. two components and the result. So Use A and B. Okay. Otherwise it's <laughs> okay. So the complex conjugate of a number mm -hmm. is simply A minus IB then. You take simply, you simply exchange the, this complex part. So A and B are real numbers and I is this complex unit and you simply exchange the sign here. That's all there is to the complex conjugate. And, and now, now on the test, if you uh, add a number and it's complex conjugate, what do you get? That's so, like double the real amount? Yeah. Okay. Yes. And you, you and flip zero. the number on the real axis. And if you add it, it's like on the real. Double, it's double, yeah. It's, it's, simple, it's simply, simply, yeah. Okay. Simply like vector addition, yeah. So it kind of works like two D vector. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, in the third point, you wish to have um, also linearity in the second argument, but this time you don't have to take the complex conjugate of it. And as the fourth property. 
since you want a certain symmetry behavior. Um, sorry, that's wrong. So, um, X and Y must equal, the result must equal the complex conjugate if you exchange the arguments in the, um, in the operation. That's all that, that's all there is. And the fifth thing you would like to have for, uh, um, for, uh, um, for the scalar product or for inner product is that um, if you have the inner product of a vector with itself, it has to be greater or equal to zero, always. And the case zero should just um, be the case if um, x equals zero. So if you have the zero vector put in there. So it's always greater than zero if you, if you take the inner product with something from, with itself. And uh, except you have the zero, the zero vector, and it's simply zero. That's what you want there to be well behaved. <clears throat> so this makes no statement if there is two different arguments to the operator. So if you have x and y, that doesn't always need to be greater really equal to zero. No, that's not that's not the case. So just with itself, just with itself. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I um, ask another question? Yeah. So um, I can't really read what you uh, wrote in the last line. Uh, case zero. A uh, case zero. Okay. Um, zero. Uh, that's only zero if. Um, if so, if with two f means. Okay. If, uh, uh, if and only if, yes. If and only if x equals the zero vector. That's zero ve oh, that's yeah, vector. That's x is zero vector. Thanks. So if it's really the zero of the vector space. Okay. Great. <laughs> and um, we call uh, um, there's a technical definition which is now becoming important. So um, uh, vector space. that is complete with a scalar product is called a Hilbert space. It's not the total rigorous definition. What complete means is a technical thing that certain um, uh, that certain uh, uh, that certain series converge into in the space. So something technical, not really important for us. But a Hilbert space is a vector space with a scalar product. That's important because later we will just work in Hilbert spaces. We will always have a vector vector space with a scalar product which we're working quantum mechanics with. So this is why I just showed you the, the inner product, what the inner product is. So you said a vector space with the scalar product is a Hilbert space. And also it also has to be a complete space. It's a complete means that um, all Cauchy series converge in this. Math stuff. Okay, okay math stuff. So, not, okay. it's a bit so that implies there is incomplete space. Yes. But incomplete means that not all Cauchy series converge in it. But we just confine ourselves to complete space, so where, seri where Cauchy series converge in the space. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's, that's just okay. something technical. Don't get lost in this. Okay. So this, I just want to make you understand what, what, a, what a Hilbert space is, because that's becoming later important. Um, How many scalar products can you have? Like there is infinite. I'm, gonna, I'm going to I'm going to show you right now one I in know one scalar product. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to show you the one in, in complex in the complex uh, numbers now. So if you have wait like five minutes and you're already at Hilbert spaces. Four <laughs> 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 um, 
So I want to show you the inner inner product in uh, or one inner product in uh, in the complex numbers. Uh, so if you take two vectors u v out of the complex uh, numbers. Um, and you do the once possible scalar product is simply taking the um, transpose of the first argument and its complex conjugate and vector uh, matrix vector multiplied with the second argument. So what's, you know what the transpose of a vector is? Is that clear? So, so simply, so simply v1, v2 transposed is just uh, uh, transforms a column vector into a row vector. The thing mathematicians need because they differentiate row and column vectors. Yeah, so now you simply reduce it to some, something of a matrix multiplication in principle. Next time I'm going to tell you something about algebra and notation and your world will change. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay, so last point I want to talk about, what happens if we put um, a, a matrix A out of, from like the complex numbers into the first argument of our just defined scalar product. So something like A times U times V. So according to our definition, this is nothing more than A times U take the complex com conjugate of each entry there and transpose it times V. So the complex, uh, the, um, the um, transpose of this expression is simply U complex conjugated transposed and A complex conjugated transposed times V. And this operation here, we shall call the, um, the, um, the conjugate transpose. And this is often denoted in physics with a dagger up the matrix. So, and this will later become important. Um, a dagger means you take the uh, complex conjugate and transpose it of a matrix. What does it mean to take the complex conjugate of a matrix? You conjugate each entry. Okay. Each entry gets Propagate complex conjugated. Conjugate. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Signing up. If and you want to remember the dice and you flip the matrix. Okay. So there are two interesting cases now which we have um, for for. Um, you don't use that notation for vectors. Um, you mean the, the arrow up, the up arrow? Or? The dagger notation. No, it's just for matrices. Uh, um, <clears throat> you will see why that's not, uh, you will see later, but it's not, uh, it's not necessary uh, for a vector. By, by the way, one of the, one of the most fundamental problems in physics is that in general relativity, all these things also show up, but the notation is totally different. <laughs> this is why we don't have a theory of everything. I'm not sure I would call that fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> oh yes, it absolutely is one of the fundamental issues of physics. You will relearn all of, so if you learn quantum mechanics in the beginning, you learn all of this notation, then you learn general relativity, and you learn all the things again, and it just looks totally different. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Just to keep the fun in. <laughs> Too easy. Yeah. And of course, it's totally different to, to standard mathematical. I have a point. Yeah. <laughs> I've seen that with the derivatives yeah. already. Like you make those plots. Yeah. Why? Okay. <laughs> so, one case which interests us in the, in the next. Like, like programming language. Which will interest us in the next few sections then is the case if this matrix, if the complex uh, transpose is equal to itself. So if a matrix is symmetric to the complex conjugation and it's transposed, then we call it a Hermitian matrix. So it stay, stays indifferent. 
Don't think about what the entries are of the metric. It will just because complete. that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Does it mean the entries are real? It would work for real. Actually, it would it? means that they are symmetric. There, there's a so they symmetry around it, so that yeah. So if, like half of them are flips of the others. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Don't think about it too much. Don't just. <laughs> so that's called Hermitian. Hermitian, yeah. That's that's, yeah. And the second one is, if um, the conjugate transpose equals the inverse of a matrix, we call, uh, we call that a unitary matrix. And. Um, why is this important? So um, a Hermitian matrix um, has only real eigenvalues. You can prove that. That's a good exercise if you want to exercise it, want to exercise for once. You can prove simply that a Hermitian matrix must have real eigenvalues. All the time. Did we, did we cover eigenvalues? Yes. Oh, that's when I was. <laughs> 35 seconds that you stepped out. <laughs> <laughs> Tough place here. Yes. <laughs> so that's, and this will, so their eigenvalues will later become the measurement results in quantum mechanics because we can only measure real quantities. So all of our measurement processes will be eigenvalues of Hermitian matrices or Hermitian operators, we call that. Don't think about it too much yet. Just give you a recap why we do that. And a unitary matrix preserves lengths or a metric. A metric gives you the length of a vector. And um, one of the simplest metrics you can come up with is the um, Euclidean length of a vector by simply taking the scalar product of a vector with itself. We denote it like that. And a very good exercise is to show that if you have a, a unitary matrix U, that for U unitary, that, um, sorry, that taking the Euclidean metric of a vector is the same as um, applying the unitary matrix before, uh, for the um, uh, into the Euclidean length. That's a simple exercise. You can once try it, set it in, and see when it can, when stuff cancels. This is important later because unitary matrices will determine or unitary operators will determine the time evolution of states in quantum mechanics. Do you have a good example of one of the matrices? <laughs> From the top of my head, um, you mean the, at the moment, not only a rotation. rotation. Oh yeah, rotation matrices, yeah. Rotation doesn't change the length of a vector, okay. it just changes the direction. Yeah. So our, our circle, our circle is a wonderful, because the, the, the speed of the vector, the, the length of the velocity vector stays the same. But, uh, it's also, you can also describe this. So, but we, like, the element of those matrices is still still complex number. Yes. Magic. Complex. Yes. Because you, you mentioned rotation. I know like rotation scaling theory from, from operations on like, like in, in image software or like in 3D games and stuff. And I figure out that's all real numbers. No, 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 no,
Yeah. <laughs> Is it wrong if it works? <laughs> there, there is now a very nice thing about cosines and sines that you can, because in your matrix you have cosines and, yes. and sines in your rotation matrix. Yes. But you can also explain them if you actually go into the complex plane by just multiplications with the, with the exponential and putting an i uh, on top there, so you can actually make uh, rotations in, in that space rather than in simple R. And why would I want to do that? <laughs> There's a very simple reason to that, and once we have finished with this seminar, I will, uh, I will introduce you to a very nice uh, a way of doing geometry. <laughs> after this seminar, okay. Because, okay. because one of the reasons that you can, that is very interesting to that is you can, for example, mathematically, show that if you concatenate these operations, like you do a rotation, you do, you, do a, you do a shift to somewhere, you move something, so the usual operations that you do in a, in a graphics program, for example. Exactly. This is why I'm setting, saying once I'm telling you about algebra, things become so nice. If you, if you formulate these in such a way, these operations, then you can form an algebra out of them, and algebra means nothing but you have rules on how to combine these objects. Yeah, you can multiply them. You can multiply them. And if you have these rules, sometimes you can just look at the rules and not actually do the operation. Because, for example, you can have such a lengthy thing and just look at all the things. And normally, in, in numerically, you would first do the first thing, then the second thing, then the third thing. And you know if it's computationally expensive, it can really get weird. You know, you have to do all these things. And suddenly, because you were stupid or whatever, this lengthy operation finally turns out that it did nothing to the vector at all for some reason. So they cancel out something. It, everything canceled out. But if you look at the algebra, algebraic rules, you would have never needed to do that computation because simply the algebraic rules would have told you that all these operations in concatenation finally mean that you're doing nothing to the vector because of that rules. Okay. And, this is, and this is heavily used actually in, in, for example, what we talked about the matrix template library that they introduced to you. That's, that's based on an algebra which says um, I'm not looking about the actual operations, but I'm just looking at the algebra of these operations. Okay. And I'm trying to fuse those things that... Yeah, great. And you're, you're showing in fact exactly <laughs> this in a few minutes. Yeah, yes. <laughs> I, I just want to show you the following. <laughs> yeah. not abiding to the rules. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so... so, so simple, <laughs> simple, simple thing. <laughs> <laughs> Next time we, I'm going to talk about economics. <laughs> this is <laughs> um, uh, okay. <laughs> Last point in this, in this chapter. Um, I need to do for ten more minutes, then we can take a short break. Um, so no. now uh, <laughs> let's uh, look at a polynomial uh, of uh, arbitrary degree. What we see here is something we can write the polynomial as in a way that we have the x to the power zero, x to the power one, x to the power da 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 till n. That looks, and now compare what does the notation of a vector mean if I say a vector one, two in unit in the standard base doesn't mean, doesn't mean just, doesn't mean just that I'm taking once the first unit vector plus two times the second unit vector. And does it look similar to you in a sense that if I would think about the x to the power something as unit vector as unit vectors, that a polynomial is similarly built up as a vector? Does that make sense to you in some sense? No. So think about um, so um, if I write this polynomial down um, two plus 4x plus 3x squared, and the rest is zero. All the others, all the other powers are zero. If I would say that um, my 
x here are simply some unit vector, which I, I cannot add x and x squared to, together if I don't know what x is, so just in this abstract sense. If I would say that, okay, I'm writing down now a list of all the coefficients that appear in my polynomial here. Okay. So simply in this case, it would be two, four, three, and the rest of all the coefficients are zero. Oh, oh. <laughs> really, really exciting when the monitor tries to shut down. So, you know how to switch this off, but in the middle of the lecture, it gets another adrenaline. So, so <laughs> you have a, you, you, could, you could write simply the coefficients in a list, and you would get exactly, and you know where each coefficient belongs to each x power. Yeah. And you would know the polynomial exactly. Yes. It's similar, and if you look at the vector representation here, that's pretty similar to what the vector representation does. You simply say, okay, I know the first entry is to be multiplied with the first unit vector in a coordinate system, and the second entry is two times the second vector. You're trying to, to convince me that uh, the x, x squares and so forth, they actually, you could picture them as like unit vectors. Yes, exactly. But now... That means all the polyn polynomials, they would make up the spacers. Yes, and now um, think about okay. how many polynomials, are, what would be the dimension of this, if you don't confine to any power of, n, uh, of x, what would be the dimension of the space? Infinite, Infinite exactly, yes. And this gives you an infinite space to some sense. And we have the same, so... Do I want that? <laughs> you can look at that and then uh, think about um, if you put up your math book of linear algebra, you can uh, look at the definitions of a vector space and then think of, and then apply this to the uh, to the polynomial space, for instance. If you think about the axis, of um, uh, as the unit vectors, and you would, it would still make sense. They would apply. So you could can think about a space of the polynomials as a function space called a function space. With just it has no finite dimension, but it can be identified as a vector space from an abstract point of view. Each function in there is a something like a vector. We don't think about it. Yeah. Uh, it's a point in the space yeah. which is vector. Yeah. Okay. And you, you're saying that, that like all the algebra that we have for those kinds of vector spaces, uh, vector spaces applies to vectors of coefficients as well. For instance, yes. Yes. This is called the R to the power R space, as far as I know from my undergrad. Is that R to the power of R? Yeah, space. Please correct me if I'm wrong. That's what I remember from my linear algebra lecture. Uh, lecture. Um, this, so you can do now everything. What you, we just did on linear algebra, we can think about this with functions. And I'm going to show you an example of what, what we what, what we uh, You just said you can do that, but is it legal? Yes. Like, does it work? Yes, it works. It fulfills. But that means uh, nobody proved that it works. Yeah. Because I can make up things and say that works. Do you make something up? Okay. Right? I'm not Please. demanding a proof because I probably don't get it. There's, there are very subtle differences between infinite spaces and finite spaces in this sense that we're not covering here. Yes. And these are subtle, but they make all the problems in the end for several reasons. Yes, of course. But this is physics. Like, you know, you're ignoring the dragon down in the cellar because this castle on top is so beautiful and you just want to live there. Yeah. Okay. This, this, this works more generally than just for polynomial? Yes, this is a general concept. So that you just use polynomials as a... As, as a, a simple system. example, it's something you can imagine. Um, we, will, we will just come to the next point of another... And space. if you're familiar with base representations, then you can think of, if you have a function, you can approximate it by a polynomial. But you can also Basis. approximate by a, a Fourier. Like a Fourier. Exactly. Yes. 
So uh, let's all of it um, is in there. It's <laughs> <laughs> let's think of a ex uh, let's think of a space. Don't care really. They they if a mathematician reads this, they now by groaning on the floor or any of you have never proved this. <laughs> <laughs> so we will look at a certain class of spaces, which I just give you the definition and we're going to talk about it. So it's called an L to the power P space of some set X. And these are, is the set of functions mapping from the set X into the complex numbers. <clears throat> who fulfills the following condition. The integral over this set X, which can be a subset of a vector space, whatever you think about. The integral and the absolute value to the power P integrated over has a finite value. That's a bit much to take in. So, so yeah. <laughs> I'll explain. Or, Michael? Just a very small reminder. This is, for example, a very uh, interesting class of spaces in uh, systems biology as well. So, uh, Ivo will frequently talk about this because this is frequently used in, in optimization processes, mainly L2 and something else. So, this is just one yeah. of those, just yeah. to draw a connection to what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, and L2, we will look at L2, L2 is especially important at the later time. No, so, it's just easy, it's not important, yeah. <laughs> it's just easy, that's, that's for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, we will just look at certain well-behaved functions around this, uh, which live in, on this uh, vector space and map into the complex numbers which have a finite a finite integral of it. So they have to like fall off to zero at some point. They have, a real, they have to be finite. They cannot diverge in a some sense. They will still, they will, uh, they will have a finite, they will cover a finite value when you integrate them. Do, do they have any other uh, conditions uh, except for this? They have to be measurable. And yeah, that's the math nerd question, the back measurable. And I don't want to talk about the technical stuff here. I, for me. <laughs> I need some help on the data types that you use here. Like, like what is X? Is it's, a, it's, a it's a vector. It's a vector. It can be a vector. It can be a scalar. It can be what? It can be a, simply a, a, a vector, uh, uh, some subset of R to the power n or C to the power n. You don't really want to specify it because you want to keep things the general, name. generic. Yes. Okay, so that's X. So what's P? P is simply the P you see here in front. Yes. It's simply a whole number. So it's an integer? Yeah. An integer, yes. yes. Okay, you have L. Okay, and, and the way that you write it as a power, it doesn't matter a lot here on the, on the L. No. No, that's, that's just notation. That's just notation. So previously, you had R to the power of R, and that was a weird space. Yes, and now you have uh, this is uh, this can be uh, one, two, up to infinity. There's also an infinite L. Infinite. I'm not going to talk about this. This thing it doesn't that, do anything to yeah, the L. That's, that's just notation. It's just you notation. The left or to, of the L, you could put it to the lower left of the L. You could put it to the lower right of the L. Yeah, it doesn't matter much. It's just notation. Yeah. It doesn't square something or that, that, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah, well, what is the meaning of this operator yeah. operation? Okay, you just want to physicists just usually or just usually like to put necessary information somewhere around the main information. But it is acting as a power on the right hand side. On the right hand side it's acting as a power on the left hand side. Uh, it's acting also as a power, but in a different way. <laughs> what does the integral mean here? How can you integrate like over what looks like? I, I don't even know what does the x mean on the it's 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 over the uh, you can make x like the whole real number space. You can make the uh, the r two space from r power of n r power n or c to the power of n. Over this. 
or like how do you integrate with this? You can integrate multiple dimensions. You can integrate, uh, you simply like write down. Not a dimension. X is, X is, yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, it's, a, it's a set, it's a subset of, 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 of algebra and like. It's a very short notation yeah. you're doing. Yes. Just basically, this notation for an integral means nothing but just take a general part of that vector space and integrate over it. So it just means don't forget that we are integrating over some X. That's what this notation means. It already is here in the back, the DX. Mm -hmm. That basically tells you you're integrating over X, and normally you would somewhat write some boundaries there in a one-dimensional integral. Yes. Or you would, in a higher dimensional space, you would put some vector space there or some, some complex shape or something over which you're integrating. Okay, so this X bounds the space on which you This X just tells you basically there will be some weirdly blobbly thing in a high dimensional space over which we integrate. And since we don't really care what it is, we don't want to confuse you with a highly bobbly shape or whatever, whatever what, what we're just repeating there that it contains X's. That's the only thing this notation tells yeah, But there's a bobbly shape over which you're integrating and it, the shape depends on X. This is basically, this contains all the X's here. It is, in, it is within the, it is described by the X's. It's a part of the vector yeah. space. So that's a capital X. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a what also. Sorry, I think I'm, I'm sorry for my notation. Which one is capital? Which one is? Ah, pulls, I got that. So this one is capital. The large X. one is the small one, and the small one is. Ah, this are different X's. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, yeah. I think it's just about trying what, what the X means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I get it, yeah. So let's, let's just take our. Um, our um, um, notation back to this, this is just <coughs> unrelated to the x's argument. Yes, 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 it's, it's, it's a subset of a vector space. It's most so the n has different types now. Yes, okay. yeah. So, the, so, 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 it can be a positive yeah. thing. Okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's us do this all the time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so good that you ask questions, yeah. And, 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 and when, what they really then like is also that they use different numerals from uh, literals from different languages. They yeah. almost all look the same. Yeah. <laughs> like this D and U. U, U, U exactly. And, exactly. And, and, they, and if you have a bad handwriting, then you use it interchangeably. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why physics lectures become complicated if you have bad handwriting and you know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had this one wonderful professor who was always writing all the Greek literals but never knew which one was which, so he was always talking. Turning on you, 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 yeah, you. <laughs> and all of the same. So, but he was talking general relativity. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so, v, so this V is now it's a set um, of yeah. vectors. Yes, yes, exactly. So, I okay. imagine that's the bobbly thing. It's a subset of R and vectors. Yeah. Okay, okay, it's a subspace. It's like, imagine that being this. Yeah. Imagine this being the C to the power n. This whole set here, and then you have like the subset V, and you or your integral goes over a set of vector, a subset of vectors. There, you can confine it. You can also take the whole C n or like the whole R n, whatever okay, you yeah. want, whatever you just. Uh, can do the whole thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So let's. Okay. Let's um, exactly. Take so take the absolute, we raise it to power. Yeah. And that should not. Go infinite. That should got no, yeah, this just should, should be a finite value. Okay. You collect all those functions and that's LP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can also take the infinite up to infinity, but that's the infinite. Space. I'm going uh, to talk about Michael. You can raise it, but then you have something special in there. I'm not going to talk about the L infinity space okay. now, but maybe later. Okay. Um, that was mean. I that's, that was really mean. <laughs> um, let me let me let me take you one last one last thing we have to to do here is doing an amazing job. By the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
can we always yeah. <laughs> uh, define a inner, an inner product on this space? On if we confine us uh, to uh, p equals two. And the answer is yes, we can. And uh, yeah. <laughs> For quite a while. <laughs> and uh, so let the functions u and v be from this L2 space over this volume here. Then I'm going to write down a different notation, which is a bit suggestive in the, in the next part, but um, bear with me. Okay u scalar product v equals simply the integral over the volume we are looking at and we'll take the complex conjugate of the first argument times the second argument in the integral and um you can show, okay. Completely lost now. Okay, sorry. Is that a capital V or? Um, no, sorry, just a small V, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry for, for my shitty notation here. Uh, <laughs> uh, just I'll use. Read the definition of L again. <laughs> because, like, what does this result to now? This means that you take. Um, the absolute squared so you simply g are functions here yeah yes u yes. and g are functions yeah these are functions and you take simply the square of the function all of all functions which are integrated and you square them have which have a finite value are in this space i'm trying to get what the arguments of the function is now so that's it's a, a vector it's a vector it so it takes an x as an argument it takes a yeah. It takes a vector as an argument. Can you define what x is here? What is x? No x. It can be. Oh no, x, x, x is an x element. Number, it can be a. Okay. A so you get a three-dimensional, seven-dimensional okay. vector in R. So if we define L on some V, then F is a function that takes elements of V. Yes. Okay. And okay. you map it to the complex numbers, and. You want to uh, you enforce that, that it has that doesn't go infinite. It doesn't go infinite, okay. doesn't go bad if you integrate over it. Okay. That's just okay. well-behaved functions which are nice to handle in integration. And, and just remember that each of these functions creates a value in a complex number. Mm -hmm. And if we take the, the absolute value squared here, then we usually get real numbers. Yes. Because Okay, then I have to uh, I explain it. So if you uh, if you multiply a complex number by its complex conjugate, and okay. um, what you will get, so if z equals a plus ib, so okay. This is the binomial formula. Exactly. Yeah. And then the i is squared, so it goes real. Yes. Okay. So it's simply a trick, huh? That's why we're taking L squared because it's L2 <laughs> because it's so yeah. easy. It's simply and it's U and G then always map to real numbers. No, U and G still map to the complex numbers, just their absolute square maps to the real numbers. Oh yeah, sorry, that was the yeah. property inside on the definition of the function. And okay. now comes another middle information because u and g are both in the vector space functions. Whatever you do with them, the result is again in a vector space of fun in the same vector space of functions. So it's like adding a vector, or multiplying a vector, or whatever. So this was the trick he played a few few slides ago, where he said those functions behave exactly like vectors. So now, what, now once you actually create operations on those things, they either map to a real value, or they map again to a vector in that vector space. For example, adding u and g 
would give you a new function u plus g that has the exact same properties. Because they're vectors, you can add functions, you can subtract functions, and because they are vectors, you can never, if you add two vectors, you end up with a vector. If you uh, subtract one vector from the other vector, you end up with a vector. You never get out of that space which is quite a neat thing to do because it means that if those two operations fulfill the condition that they are in L2, the combination of them also does that. Because you can't get out of your vector space. Yeah. I'm trying, whether, I'm trying to re remember where the vector space came in. Correct. Those, this is just because we defined that these are in this vector space. Yeah, yeah I'm trying to unroll the last five slides in my head. Okay. <laughs> it's like, I'm like, I'm like, I need to like resolve again. What is R? What is B? And like navigate yeah. back in okay. my head. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. No, no, no problem. Sorry. Quick note here. Um, if I write U star, that's physics notation for the complex conjugate. I will use it from now on. That's. Didn't you use a bar? Why? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I usually use a bar, but physicists got somehow used to using a star. So you're switching notation. Yeah, I'm switching notation now, so that you just that you know okay. what I'm what I'm doing here. Maybe maybe, maybe you uh, can stick with the bar notation instead. I could also but stick with the bar. Okay. Kill you. No, it wouldn't kill me at all. Then stick with the bar notation. Okay, stick. It's stick. having just another notation. In. It's, it's it's okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and it's a good exercise to show that this actually fulfills the. Um, definition of an inner product. You can try this out at home if you want to. So uh, um, show that uh, this that this mapping written UV. Uh, also, this year uh, now you see that I wrote a straight bar in the uh, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, Eugene. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a very bad situation. No, no, it's, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's indeed, uh, it's, uh, indeed uh, or it fulfills the definition of an inner product. So you remember that a while ago we put out all these rules for inner product. Mm -hmm. I will upload the slides and then you can compare. Now that would be my next question because now you need. Is u pipe g in angle brackets like you define a new binary operator? Yeah, via oh, yeah, this notation. So this okay. binary and operator is that one. It's okay. that integral, and it's unrelated to inner products. And now you say, well, by accident, this is an inner product. You can show that it's an inner product in this in okay. the L two yeah. space. You can show that it's not by accident, but you can show it. You can prove it. Really, you just that's a, that's a special property of L two. Yes. Uh, so not so you can define other uh, scalar products on all those LP spaces, yeah. but um, this is now the usually the use uh, inner product for L two, and we will use that extensively later. Okay. So this is yeah this is why I'm showing it. This for for the mathematic cracks, it, it is also related to the metric of yeah. the it's, uh, You just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 Uh, so, um, just to, to to recap that. So first, first, uh, just just to, to show you what what the <laughs> what the metric of a uh, the the the, uh, the sense of length in those spaces. So first of all, like this, like uh, if we take a vector x uh, from C n or something like that. Um, um, then um, the length of a vector is simply the uh, the Euclidean length is the square root of the uh, scalar product with itself. So simply, I think on a previous slide you didn't have the square root. Oh, and okay. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and I know you were having like the square lengths. Oh yeah, then I had the square lengths. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. I, uh, What's the Euclidean length now? With so it's it's simply without? this. It's simply if you take um, um, it's 
Again, that's, for, that's now not a function x in this case, this is a vector now. Just, I'm just showing you the finite dimensional thing when I'm showing you the analog on, on in the LP space for, for length. So okay. this is sim you simply so do the Euclidean length now. Yes. With the square root. Yes, because okay. otherwise you get the square length. So if you okay. do this, put the square root in, then yeah, yeah. You know that probably from computer graphics, the Euclidean I, I, length of something. Pretty. And I know it with the square root. As well. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Can, exactly. Okay. Great. So, what is the two, the, the lower two, the, the, the subscript? That's uh, that's a script for that you take the um, uh, that you uh, take the square root out of it. Otherwise, you can also take another uh, higher square root out of this expression here. Yeah, that's. Yeah, you can you can put this also as. Uh, okay. As a, uh, you can also put a, uh, no, I'm not putting a P in there. You can generalize matrix, a uh, 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 metric to a, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I know putting the P is right there, but it's highly confusing. Yeah. But this, this, is, this is the norm. So this is the, the norm. norm. Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is the, the, the you, I know that the normal predictor, yeah, LP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have the same is, the yeah. So, so, so for this, I, this is, the two is it translates two exactly the analog way to the, LP norm. So I'm just showing this as again as from, from a complex uh, vector space, and now I'm going to show it for an L2 space, and it's it's it's, it's the same thing. It's you simply you simply take the 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 um, so now let's take a function out of the L2 space. And simply Make this do the same thing. Preserve, pres uh, do, uh, sorry, um, do the same. Do exactly the same thing with it. We simply we just put we integrate a function with its complex conjugate over the space, and this gives us the notion of a length in this infinite vector. Can you, can you write your piece a bit different from the use? Oh, yeah. You're really becoming a good theoretic. <laughs> <laughs> and please don't introduce news, then we're... No, yeah, then you're screwed. <laughs> uh, I have a question on the second line. I'm trying to parse this. So here it says x is an element of, of c to the power of n. So that's a vector of complex numbers. Yes, exactly. This is, this is uh, the finite dimension. Is equal to the square root of something. Mm -hmm. no. Oh, sorry, this is just a... Uh, this should be... This should, be a, this should follow a comma after the first line. Do a comma, comma. Okay, it just so tells that's, you something a, on that's the, a very good on the first line. Exactly. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, but that's now the in the first line where you have any angle brackets, that's a comma and not a pipe. Uh, pause. Uh, uh, so, so it's not the, the, the inner product that you find on the last slide. This it is, is an inner product. It's yeah. just a, again a switch in notation. Yeah. You should do the. Oh, uh, yeah. The problem is we are interchanging this new notation again and again, either using the comma or the pipe. Yeah, but we had the comma for like general inner products and now the pipe for this specific thing on L2. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> so the first line you're using the specific L2 operator here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, that's no one up there. Or is it the general one? That's the general. So I'm sorry. But it's also the and general ones. They always they always equivalent to this x uh, conjugate transposed. Like this go. This works for for all x inner products for x element c n. And this works for all inner products. Uh, no, for the the inner product for this is defined as the one below. That's actually a different issue. Does it still make sense to you? Okay, so, okay, okay. <laughs> Max, okay. Max, it's just notation. It's, it's, it's just, just notation. notation that is confusing. Okay. Yeah. What, what people, Bernard is still up there. Yeah. It's like what the, the, the thing on the first line under the square root. This still? That's, okay. that's not the definition from the last slide, or is it? No, no, this is for the finite dimensional. 
Okay, so I just, okay, I'm sorry, this was a very confusing example. I just want to show you here what happens. So before we I introduced you to functional spaces, we have those finite dimensional spaces, like with vectors just. And with vectors, we can simply take the Euclidean length of them by putting them together, putting with itself together in the inner product, mm -hmm. take the square root out of it. That's what I wanted to show you with this line here. Um, but does, but does this relationship hold outside of L2? So if, if you're in L3, then... Like below here? Uh, no, that the first line. The first, first line. line. Then you take the cube root of the inner product, or...? This no, that does not hold. No. So the question, this is just... So what, what Max is trying to convey here is, this is a very funny way of writing the Euclidean norm. That only works in L2. That only works in... This is not L2. The axes there are just vectors. standard vectors in Cn. We are not talking about functions. Okay, yeah. so we broke out of this whole LP thing here. Yeah. Now we're talking about something different. Yeah, just we talk about okay. just about the finite dimensions. I wanted to actually make this easier, but confused it. Yeah. <laughs> His idea was this is this is just the standard way of writing the Euclidean norm of a vector where the vector is a complex vector in Cn. So it's a long line of numbers, you know, a vector with n entries, and each of these n entries is a complex number. Mm -hmm. And if you want to compute the Euclidean norm of that, mm -hmm. uh, then you actually do the inner product and take the square root out of that. And how do you do the inner product? You do this by simply uh, 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 multiplying the complex, uh, the transposed complex conjugate of this vector. Yeah. So you take each element of the vector and make a complex conjugate and you transpose it. So you make it like that. And the other one you just keep. And then you have an element wise multiplication. And that means each element of the vector is is multiplied with its complex conjugate. Mm -hmm. So it becomes real. Mm -hmm. So if we have A plus IB in brackets times A minus IB in brackets, actually the other way around, but it doesn't matter. It's <laughs> <laughs> whatever you add it up. Whatever you add it up. Yeah. And now you got the, you get, uh, and because now uh, it's, a, it's a binomial, uh, rule, you get the square, and because you get the square, now you take the square root and you get the standard norm or length, yeah. what you're talking about. <laughs> and the only thing he wanted to convey with these two slides was, with these two lines was, this is the standard way of taking a length of these complex vectors. And he wanted to introduce this because following down there, he does this exact same thing now in notation. So that's in notation with functions. So not with vectors anymore, which have some elements, mm -hmm. but with those functions we have been talking about. And they behave just exactly as those CNs. Yeah. So they're, they're, they're exactly the same in, in all their behavior. So, so whenever we thought, think about these functions, we just go back to the, to the example we understand of these complex vectors, and we know how these functions behave, which is strange because they're functions, you know, they're like, they're like polynomials or something like that. And I can't easily do this in my head, but I don't have to because I know that they behave exactly like those standard vectors, and that I can keep in my head. At least I can. So because I can't do the other side. Here, like on the third line, under the square root of the integral, you have u with a, with a horizontal bar on top. Yeah, so but the, the complex conjugate of u. Of a function. Of a function, yeah. Oh, not of the result of the function, of the function. 
<laughs> in the end, you take the result, of course, of, of, of the complex conjugate of the result. I would have, I, I, I love you. And this is very important because, because Bernard is thinking in, and this is very important now, UX, as you remember, is in this L2 and points to C. This is why I was pointing out that it has a result in C. So as a computer scientist, and I think also as a mathematician, you would put the bar over the result of ux, so exactly u applied to x, while the physicist, of course, because we're lazy and we're always changing notation in between, we think that's the same as just putting a bar over, over u. Okay. Yeah. It's the same when you write... Notation is so important. I compare this to when you write sine square of, of x, you also not squaring the sine, you're squaring the result of the sine. Yes. Which is also yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay, it is okay. 11.32. Okay. And I, uh, I have to go. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank <laughs> you very much. <laughs> You're doing much worse in time than I thought. Um, okay, um, so this is now the excursion to um, linear algebra in function spaces. Just the last point, then we're finished with this chapter and then we can see Are what we do next. Okay, because then I have to do lunch. Um, <laughs> no, not yet. Um, so, can we do we have any analogon for like uh, linear operations in these spaces? Like, do you think there's can you come up with something linear which acts li linearly on a function somehow? Do you have an idea what that could be? Is, is from the top of your head? Not in an X for like taking the mean of a density function. Well, even simpler, you can also take in simply the derivative of a function, which is also linear. So if you take, um, yeah. <laughs> so if you take, um, you're doing very good, by the way. <laughs> thank you. Uh, if you take, so no, just general now. So if you take the derivative of uh, of uh, expression like this, it's the same thing as. this expression here. So it's also linear. So this is not... Sorry again for asking. Oh, sorry. Uh, so plus five and... G, for, G of X, G is sorry, that's okay. my, my, uh, okay. no, my pen is a bit... Uh, yes, so that's also, again, the, this hits the definition of linearity now. So we can now go from, in our function spaces, Ooh. Okay, I, I can see how that, that relates. Yeah, we go from a matrix. I still don't know why. A. Why one would do that? We go to to linear. We call them now because this is obviously not a matrix. Uh, taking the derivative of something, it's not. A, this is something different. But we can generalize this concept somehow, and we call this if um op, uh, we call this now an operator. If something acts on functions in a way that is linear, we can we simply call this a linear operator. And since it's not the same thing as a matrix, it's often denoted with a hat on it. So something like that. And the definition of a linear operator is simply if the operator so now let's take again um, u and v out of the L2 space. And I'm now going, going to call the set omega for better notation. Um, and simply have, a, oh, simply have a linear combination of, um, uh, of um, to functions in this space, which we are allowed to do because we are acting on a vector space and alpha, beta are elements of C to the power n. Then this has to be the same thing if A is linear as applying the operator to the function simply multiplied by this scalar. 
I think that's a very good stop. Yeah. So okay, that's now. So a can be something like a derivative, something whatever you can think of that acts on function in a linear way. I'm not making any things, and it just should preserve the fact that u and v are living in this L2 space. So, so the, the trick that, that Max did here was basically introducing or you know, reminding you of your standard linear algebra. You have vectors, you compute lengths of the vectors, you add vectors, you subtract vectors, and especially you can make an inner product on vectors. So this was all repetition on linear algebra. And the funny thing now is, if you can find a vector space functions, you can also do the same thing. You can add functions, you can subtract functions, and you can define an inner product. So that was the one big step. You can actually define an inner product for functions, and you can also define operators on the functions that act in the same way as matrices act, act on vectors. It's not easy to write a good, to write down these operators like a matrix, like here's an entry there, here's an, there's a number there, and so on. But they all have the exact same properties. Then, your matrices in your standard vector space. And this is amazing. This is absolutely amazing because uh, think, for example, you're almost doing the same thing for your rotation matrix. Think, of, think back to your rotation matrix that you apply very often in, your, uh, in, in, in computer graphics. The entries to that are not values. The entries of my rotation value, uh, of my rotation matrix. They are functions. They're cosine signs of a certain parameter. And of course, for a standard, for a standard uh, 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 angle alpha, mm -hmm. those give you values. Yes. But more generally, you actually do not have a, a, a real valued matrix, but a matrix with entries of functions. And this is more than just a matrix. That's actually something like a, like, like a function written in a more complex way of writing something that acts on a vector. Now, for you, it's just a convenience because you, you know that the rotation matrix should be written like this. And for mm -hmm. every alpha, it results in just values within that matrix. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's an operator. It is a real, it, you, you give it, you give it a, a, a parameter, a real parameter, that's the angle for rotation. You even write it like this, you give it a real parameter, and out comes an action of the, on the vector that rotates the vector. So it does something to the vector. So that sounds like a higher order function. That is something that's called that an operator. I, I bind the parameter, the angle, and it gives a function that I can apply to something. Exactly. And the outcome of the operation on this vector is again, on this vector that you rotated, is again in that, ro in that vector space. Mm -hmm. And for that specific operator, it's even as we, as we already talked about, normal conserving, so length conserving. The rotated vector has the same length than the initial vector, nothing happened. Mm -hmm. It's just rotated. So, the example of de, d over dx, the derivative on a function. The funny thing with this is, it has the exact same properties. And it does something like this. It now doesn't give you a result. The vector is in a, in a, in a function space, remember. So the, the vector is actually a function. And the derivative on a function is again a function. And you can show mathematically if the f, the, the vector, the function, 
preserves this in L2, then the derivative of that function is also in L2. So the first thing that this operator does is that the result of this operator is again in the vector space, like your, like your rotation. Mm -hmm. When you rotate the vector, it's still in the vector space. It didn't go anywhere else. Mm -hmm. So it's still a valid vector. So great DE over DX does that. Now, it also is linear. We just showed that down there, as is the rotation, by the way. Rotation is also linear operation. So the mathematics here is that you might not now get into your head, how do I write the matrix for a derivative? There is none in that sense. I cannot write down what, what A with the head is. It's, yes, you can, you can, by the way, but that's not necessary because okay. now we don't need to do this anymore because we know how to take a derivative. We know what, what the outcome of A working on B actually is. You can take a derivative of a function. But the funny thing is it acts in the exact same way as your rotation in R squared or R, R3 or whatever. It does not matter. And this is such a fundamental concept that you can now take abstract things like a function and work with them in the exact same way as your standard R2 or R3 vectors. And that you have operations on these vectors like a, like a, like a rotation or like a, a, a movement or whatever that you would normally express in computer graphics via matrix in some way. Yeah that also have the same kind of properties. And now you don't have to write all these, as in your code, you don't have to write out all these matrices anymore. You just define them somewhere. Somewhere you give them a name. And then all you do is basically concatenate them together to do something to that vector. And this is the whole exercise my, uh, Max actually wanted that's, to get you. That's all I wanted to show you now. Think of functions now as vectors. That's all you have to do. This is also this is also great. Why this is the numerical seminar? Because if as soon as you start thinking about functions as vectors, it also opens up a whole can of new possibilities to solve partial differential equations and so on. All of those really sophisticated schemes, like the discontinuous Galactic engine. What do I know? They are all based on the fact that you can act on functions as like on vectors. You. And you should just keep that thinking, get that thinking in that's your head. Whole, that's that's a whole, the whole trick behind OpenFPM, by the way, and, and the, the, the particle derivative method that Ibu yeah. does as well. Yeah. It's a whole, it's just this fucking thing. Sorry, that, that was yeah. recorded. <laughs> 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 I <beep>. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you, you said I can think of function as vectors, and in the very beginning you said yeah, the other function uh, we can think of it as a vector because it was a pol polynomial. Yeah. So we are still only considering no, no, that are polynomial. no, no, no. We are thinking general functions which have just a finite integral over some. So where did that came in? Justin asked the exact okay. same question about an hour ago. Okay, then I wasn't mentally prepared yet. So, <laughs> so those, are, those things can be. That's exactly good. This so can go back to that one. It can be something more general. Um, so I have a slight lag in my screen presentation. Yes, if we go back here, we will just we would so these functions just have to just aren't allowed to. Uh, diverge if you integrate over them. They just have to have a finite integral, and this can be a range of functions. Think of something like a Gaussian packet, like a Gaussian function, for instance. I would, I would again, I, I would answer in the same way as I answered, mm -hmm. answered uh, uh, Justin. Mm -hmm. uh, you know how to approximate a function, hopefully. Have you ever done a, an, an, uh, you have some function and you want to approximate it with another function? Have you ever done a fit on function? I can fit the data points. Exactly, yes. Yeah. You can also just think of it that the data points is give, are given by a function. Okay. 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 So, so here's, here's your function. 
Okay, my laptop is low on battery. But you should just switch to the 60 watt instead. There yeah. are two. Yeah. Um, let's see if something bad happens now. Of course. Ah, now it's finally back. <laughs> okay. So if you right. fit a polynomial to that, you take the first degree polynomial that's in there. The second degree polynomial. Oh, yeah. I don't know how. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, but if you fit globally, I don't know. No, well, the fit goes bad here. Okay. If you're fitting now a parabola. Um, if you're fitting a third degree polynomial, look, it's bad because yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. you start down here, you go up here, you go up here. Okay. But, and you go on, you add all of those. And yeah. you see that I'm starting to approximate this. Yeah, you're converging. You're converging. Yeah. This is a very bad function for polynomials because it's the sine function or the cosine function, doesn't matter. Because it's it's, it's not a parcel of it's waves. <laughs> exactly. So it's, so it's basically periodic. And a much better way to approximate this is by a so-called Fourier series. You might have heard about this. I heard the term Fourier. Okay, so this is basically just a, a series of alpha sine like x plus sines of the beta cosine x, you know, and alpha and beta are some coefficients. And this is approximation is very easy. Beta is zero. Alpha is one, and you're done. But of course, you can't have many of those. You could have you could sum up sum them up differently, and so on. So, so if that wouldn't be that case, but another thing, it would of course require more of these terms. Now, what you saw is that I can approximate this function by polynomials, mm -hmm. but I can also approximate it by some oh, sorry, sines yeah. and cosines. Yeah. And these are, in fact, different sets of function spaces, so exactly the vector spaces we just talked about. So I can create a vector space, actually the Fourier vector space, by functions that look like this, or by functions that look like polynomials. And now the very nice thing, if you really know vector spaces, is that they have a basis, a base. Okay, I understand the basis. So the basis interestingly, sign here, this representation, if you now look at it, you have a basis. How do you express every vector in the vector space? The linear By linear combinations, combinations of the base vectors. Yeah. Huh. That looks almost like a linear Combination, you know, you have this is a function, so this is a base. This looks almost like a base vector. It's a bit different. But this look, almost looks like a base vector, and this almost looks like a base vector, although it's a function. And I can approximate every function just by linear combinations and summing over them. And I'm doing the exact same thing with the polynomials. Okay. Now we cover the two approximations of functions. Exactly, and that is the answer to your question. Mm -hmm. Because I can do that, it doesn't matter whether it's a polynomial or if it is, is described by a Fourier series, or I can come up with some weird shit, usually some, hi there, uh, usually some Russians came up with it or some French guys. So whenever you need to remember those names, it's either French or Russian. Um, and, and, and the idea behind that is, is that as long as your function is within that vector space or in that, that vector space, it is just somewhat described by either polynomial or something like this, but it doesn't matter because you just have to fulfill this requirement defined by LP. And many of the functions can actually be nicely described by both this and this. There are a lot of functions where it don't really matter whether they're described like this or described, that's just your choice. So I showed you that this is much nicer described by this series than by this so naturally, if you want to have your life easy, you take this one. But I can show you that with an infinite Taylor series, I can also go here. 
Fair enough. Fair enough, but that would require a lot of parameters. While here, I just need one. It's just easier, you know? It's just a choice. It's just the base choice, basically. So there are some all functions that I can somehow represent in a vector space. Yes, with a few caveats. <laughs> because because of the infinite what, stuff. What's, what's square root work? Sorry? Square root is a function. <laughs> yes. That would work. Square root is a function. It's a, it's a function. 